My name is Nancy Kreef. I'm a horticulture educator with the Illinois Extension in the Cook County area and happy to be here. Um, we're going to jump right into basics of home composting. So I always ask people why not compost? Honestly, I think it's it's uh, relatively easy to do and it's just great for the environment and that you're diverting uh, waste from our landfills. Um, so I really hope you're here to think about composting or maybe um, advance your composting methods because you're already doing it at home. So we will cover what you see listed here today from the basics of why, um, some methods, how to um, ease, ease the workload, and then um, as far as timing of starting with seasonality and, and your outdoor environment, and then of course, how to use the compost and troubleshoot. So composting is uh, by definition really the biological decomposition of organic material into a humus-like substance, um, not, not hummus, um, uh, called compost. Um, so this could be at different stages and, and uh, of, of breakdown of the breakdown process. And we'll talk to, um, we'll talk about how to determine when your compost is ready. So really um, with compost, it's a lot of plant matter that has been decomposed and recycled and could be used as a fertilizer or soil amendment. Um, typically the nutrient levels are fairly low, um, you know, like usually less than 1% of N, P, and K, unless you're using, you know, um, a lot of food waste will bring up your nutrient level, um, manure will bring up your, your nutrient level. Um, so keep that in mind. It's, I see this more as a, of a huge soil amendment um, that helps make nutrients more available in the soil because compost really helps to break apart clay soil and also hold together sandy soil by coating the aggregates in, in the soil. Um, so it's really helpful as a soil, soil amendment and improves your soil texture. <clears throat> and it's certainly the key in organic farming. So as I mentioned before, reasons to compost, um, less waste in our landfill fills. You know, if you are an apartment dweller or a condominium dweller, you don't have space outside, you could certainly do it indoors. There's a few different methods. Oftentimes we recommend worm composting indoors and we'll touch upon that. It's uh, cheap and relatively easy to do. And of course, the benefit of improving your soil health and again, this, as you uh, sift this and have a nice clean product at the end, um, you could use that for seed starting, also on your house plants. And what, it, what it's really doing is feeding that micro and macro fauna, improving that soil structure, and then additionally helping retain nutrients and moisture. So just looking at some of the facts, um, per person per year, we're producing on average about 230 pounds of waste from our landscape. Um, and on the other side, we're, we're producing about 100 pounds of food scraps per year per person. Um, so unbelievably, you know, we're above 300 pounds per person of solid waste every year. These figures come from Cornell. And if this is not a, you know, astonishing, like, wow, I should really try to do something um, you know, here's kind of the facts. And I, it's funny when I see these bag leaves, I'm usually the one um, going to pick up bag leaves on the curbside as I'm in need of uh, brown or those carbon rich materials for starting my bin in the fall. So I talked about um, benefits, but again, really coating those particles in the soil is, is its major role. So it's improving structure and texture of the soil. Um, as these uh, micro and macro organisms um, are active, they will be feeding on compost and that's gonna help to um, make nutrients more available. Of course, increasing uh, moisture and air in the uh, soil reduces water runoff, again, by binding those soil particles and could certainly save you money by replacing your store-bought soil amendments. 
So when we dig deep into the decomposition process, we're really looking at two life forms. That's our microorganisms and our macroorganisms. So I think of micro as a lot of bacteria you can't see with the unaided eye. You would need a microscope. Um, some fungi you could see, actinomyces, um, you could see with the trained eye. And, and these are the elements that are really breaking down um, the components of your compost chemically. And then the macroorganisms come in and feed on these microorganisms and grind, bite, and chew materials into smaller pieces. So these are the larger ones. You could see um, all the creepy critters like mites, centipedes, <laughs> things like sow bugs, worms, flies. Um, so these are good guys. If you ever have an overwhelming number of flies, uh, you know, that's not great. Um, a population of mites will actually control fly larva. And you want to always be sure to bury your food, bury it at least, you know, 12 inches into the pile. Um, and that will... Um, deter numerous flies. Some are okay though. So when you think about building your pile, think of it as a, as a recipe. Um, and here are some of the ingredients more simplified. Uh, carbon rich materials are typically brown or dry. Um, that's not always the case. Same with um, greens. <clears throat> you know, for instance, coffee grounds are um, darker brown color, but they're actually a nitrogen rich product. So a lot of times I like to think of uh, the nitrogen rich products as wet. Of course, it needs air. So aeration, turning it weekly, that will speed up the process. Of course, if you have a more passive system, you know, you don't have to get out there um, and turn it weekly, but the process of breakdown um, decomposition is just slowed if you're not turning it on a regular basis. And then of course, water. So you could add water um, if you're using, using a lot of <clears throat> wet materials like your food waste or fresh grass clippings that will add moisture. And you really want it the moisture level of a wrung out sponge. So browns, these are carbon rich products, um, could include straw to woody pruning, shredded paper, cardboard. If you're using something like wood chips or sawdust, I would you know, limit those products because they are uh, heavy in carbon and it will take them that much longer to break down. And so you do want to have a balance of your carbon to nitrogen ratio, which I will get into in a little bit. And some of these heavy carbon products are very rich in carbon. So you do want to be careful and not overdo it with those ingredients. Greens are what are providing your nitrogen. So your fruit and vegetable trimmings, if you do a lot of juicing, that's great to have that pulp, uh, left remaining pulp to um, add to your compost bin. Of course, grass clippings, I would recommend using non-treated grass. Um, not everything breaks down in a compost pile, so you do wanna be careful of that. You know, with young weeds, it's especially if they're going to seed, I would only be using that in a hot compost pile system where your temperatures are hitting that 140, 150 degree mark to kill off any uh, weeds. Coffee grounds and filters, eggshells, tea bags, and manures. Um, of course, never do um, use your uh, cat or dog feces or anything like that, thinking more of the barnyard animals. And I do like to rinse out my eggshells um, in case of cam uh, contamination of salmonella. So when it comes to air and water, um, because uh, composting is an, a, this type of to your typical backyard um, bin or your worm composting bin is an aerobic process, um, it needs air, it needs oxygen. So you want to keep turning, make sure you have some holes in your bin for ventilation and things like that. And again, with that water, your moisture level, you're looking at about 50 to 60% by weight. Think of it as a, a wrung out sponge. So um, maintenance involved, turning that pile regularly. If it's too dry, water it. If it's too wet, you could add those dry brown materials. So what to compost, what not to compost. Certainly, um, again, your, your yard trimmings are good. Large branches, you don't want anything really over, I would say less than that, you know, if you're pruning your trees, I would say if you could shred those, that would be ideal, um, but at least cut those into 
six inch pieces, maybe certainly less than a, a one inch diameter, maybe less than a half inch diameter. Um, Cause you will note if you ever throw those, something like even a sunflower stalk, um, it takes my, I still find mine in there if I didn't cut it up um, small enough, I would still find it in there a year, a year into the compost bin. I do love straw. Um, sterile straw is great. Nothing with seed heads because you certainly don't want uh, seed heads to be surviving. And then you might have oats and wheat popping up over your garden. Um, so I do investigate the straw bales to check if there's any seed heads in there. And certainly if it just starts sprouting from the bale, that is not something I would use. <clears throat> um, of course, most of your vegetable and fruit scraps are great tea grounds, uh, coffee grounds. I would re remove something like a staple from your tea bags. And then if you don't, if you have weeds without seed heads and, you know, allow the roots to dry, um, you could get away with those in, in a cold system. So try to shy away from disease plants. Again, um, disease pathogens aren't killed in a, comp uh, a cold compost system. So we'll, we'll talk about the differences between hot and cold in a little bit. But um, they, they, they don't have the ability to, to kill off those pathogens in a cold system. So avoid those. Certainly no um, meats, bones, fats, uh, pet or human waste. Absolutely not. I do hear people trying to use this. And it's just certainly not a good idea with any foodborne illnesses. And certainly applying this to um, food products, edible gardens. Um, uh, stay away from that. Dairy products. And then of course, those fresh weeds with the seed head. So avoid that last list. So I talked about that carbon and nitrogen ratio and that is a key factor in composting. So as you look at different ingredients or different materials you're adding to your compost bin, they will have um, a carbon and nitrogen ratio. And I'll show you a table in a little bit. Um, really you want that optimum ratio right around 20 to 30 to one. So that's 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. That's kind of the sweet spot. Um, <laughs> and then as far as oxygen, you know, you want to add air to um, as you turn it, but you don't want to, to have a, a compost bin located where, where it's a lot of wind because that could dry it out too fast. Again, keeping that moisture factor of a wrung out sponge. So I usually just eyeball it, don't want anything dripping. Um, and, you know, just stick my hand in there with a glove and kind of feel around to, to get an idea of the moisture level. Temperature factor, um, optimum range is going to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you get above 150, that's when you start killing off the beneficial micro and macro organisms. So you don't want to get um, much above 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally, that particle size factor, as I mentioned, um, try to trim or shred, shred those into less than six inch pieces and that will speed up the process. And then um, volume factor in our area around Illinois, usually we're looking at one cubic yard. So something like a three by three foot, um, three by three by three foot space and certainly no larger than five by five by five. Okay, so at low carbon to nitrogen ratio, nutrients are released. So again, that sweet spot of about uh, 20 to one, 30 to one. And as you get a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, nutrients tend to be tied up in the soil. So they're immobilized and um, there's just not enough nitrogen to help with this decomposition process. So you could think of it similar to adding a lot of wood chips to your garden. You know, they're great as a, as, a, as a mulch, but as those start to break down, they will actually rob some nitrogen out of the soil because they're just so heavy, rich in, in carbon. Um, so that's something you might need to supplement nitrogen in those cases. And I talked about this table. So here's just an average of some carbon and nitrogen ratios. As you could see, something like sawdust could be 200 to 500 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. You know, I, I rarely use sawdust in a compost pile. It would be a light sprinkle if I did. 
And of course, you would never want to use treated wood. Uh, wood chips, you know, again, they're looking at 500 to 700 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So very, very carbon rich. Use those um, very limited, if at all. And so things that kind of just naturally break down where they're in that 20 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen ratio. Um, green hay, some of your fruit waste will be pretty close to that. Um, manure, a lot of your vegetable trimmings, vegetable waste. Um, so it's important to um, balance this. You know, if you're putting in a heavy, um, rich carbon material, make sure you balance that with a heavy nitrogen material, like your fresh grass clippings or vegetable waste. So composting methods. Um, this is really um, something to think about, especially with local ordinances. This is where you're going to be holding your material. Um, and <laughs> it could be held before entering the compost process. So um, what I do at home is I actually have stationary bins where I'm storing um, right in my kit. I have this kind of kitchen pail. And so I, I store that um, as it fills. I will actually store that in the freezer and um, bring that out because what I the method I use is kind of add as you go. I built the pile, but then as I accumulate more food waste from my kitchen, I will open up the bin, add uh, my food materials, top it off with something like straw, and then close it back up. And that's kind of add as you go. It's a cold compost system, and it takes a bit longer to get a finished product. Um, but it, so if you have a stationary bin outdoors, you could use uh, wooden, plastic, metal, masonry, uh, turning, turning units are usually on these hinges. They could be raised up above ground, kind of like those tumblers. And that's easy to mix if you don't want to be digging in there and turning it <clears throat> more manually. Um, heaps, you're not going to have a structure. So up in Cook County where we are, you know, the city of Chicago has regulations. So we do need a structure. But if you're in some suburban areas or more rural areas, you might have um, some more freedom to use these heaps. Of course, there is sheet composting and lasagna gardening where you're layering all compost materials at once um, to let's say build a new garden bed. Um, as that breaks down, it's, it's almost at the stage of fully decomposition. Then you could start planting right in um, that layered material and have a great uh, photo to, to show that, um, to demonstrate that method. And then in pitch or trench composting, you would be burying uh, compost materials into the ground. So that's kind of like the underground process versus sheet composting is more of like the above ground process. <clears throat> I mentioned those local ordinances. So of course, um, check in with your municipality to see if there's any regulations on composting. Um, ideally, you know, locate this on your site, we're going to be able to easy access it and um, make use of it. All right, always keep that minimal size in mind of one cubic yard. And then optimum season to bring compost piles when you have the most material. So having that carbon and nitrogen uh, source available, a lot of times for me, that will be for spring cleanup and also fall cleanup. So that's typically when I am starting my compost piles at home. And then tools, there's, I love a, like the 10 tying pitch fork. That's really easy to um, lift and maneuver compost there. If you have like a container with a smaller entry hole, you could use like a turning fork. There's things called the wing dinger where you push it in and then two prongs come out as you pull it up. And that's nice light duty, you know, if you need, uh, you know, more ergonomic, if you needed those types of tools pruners or shredded, you know, pruning to cut those pieces into that six inch range. And for your woody materials or for your leaves, it's great to have a shredder. I don't have a shredder, but um, absolutely love trying to shred my leaves first. What I have done in the past is shred um, leaves on my lawn, uh, bag them up, and then add them into the compost pile as I need comp, um, carbon rich materials. And we'll talk about what you know, shredding and, and reducing volume size um, helps. How does that benefit a pile? And then a compost thermometer is always nice. If you're doing hot composting, 
we really should be monitoring temperatures on a regular basis and, and seeing if that core of your compost pile is reaching those you know, 140, 150 degree temperatures. So when you're looking to, um, to lead to successful gar uh, composting and in, in these initial steps, um, locate uh, a specific area on your property. Again, some sun is great out of major wind. Um, you know, if generally compost piles or compost heaps or bins aren't the most attractive. So you could probably tuck it away in an area that's hidden. It'd be nice uh, to be close to your vegetable garden or somewhere not too far from your kitchen door. So as you could um, add materials, it makes it a little bit easier on you. Um, decide on your compost bin system. Do you want that heap? Do you want the bin or the pile or the tumbler? Um, what materials do you have? Um, how do you plan to get water to your compost? So if you're working with school or community gardens, that's all things to think about. Um, water is important as, as this pile dries out. Again, remember that's one of the main ingredients. So you do have to add it from time to time. And then planning a strategy, how to aerate that. I talked about different tools or again, they do have these uh, compost bins that are, that are shaped like a, a sphere and you could roll them around like a ball. And then of course, selecting your compost system and, and we'll talk about DIY projects and also um, ones that you could commercially purchase. Okay, so building your pile. Um, so I talked about those ingredients of uh, carbon, nitrogen, air, water. Uh, now I like to think about those as uh, layering them um, like a lasagna. So when you're starting to build a batch of compost, layer materials thinly uniformly, you would begin and start with brown material. So that allows, <laughs> has a little bit more aeration to it. It's dry, so it would allow um, air to come in from the bottom, and then on the top, it caps it off to hold in odors, um, again, to protect those green wet materials, especially if it's a food waste product to, to keep uh, any type of pests down. Um, so I always like to say don't dump and run. Always uh, bury your green wet materials below a brown woody material. If you can, start the pile on bare ground. That's where a lot of microorganisms will come into place, but you could also sprinkle light layers of uh, soil in between each of these because that's where a lot of the microorganisms, macroorganisms are coming from to aid in the breakdown process. And as you add each layer, just like a lasagna, you would add your sauce, you're going to add your um, water to each layer. And so <laughs> your carbon, so I talked about each individual material having a carbon and nitrogen ratio, but then as you're building your layers, um, you do want to have, you want to think about your, your whole parts of green, your whole parts of brown. So one part green to two to th three parts brown is a recommendation. If you're doing hot composting, you would do a ratio of one part green to two parts brown. If you're in a more passive system, you could easily get away with one part green to three part brown. So think about you know, how many inches it would be, one inch of green to two inches of brown, uh, back to one inch of green to two inches of brown if you're in a hot system. And again, that one to three ratio for the cooler system. Chop, chop, chop. I couldn't, can't stress that enough. Um, the more you chop down, the quicker they break down. Those tools like a chip or shredder is, is really helpful if you want to be serious and, and try to eliminate all of your yard waste. Um, it's really going to ease the process and you could build up to that because I know they can be expensive. So as you, as you start with a small bin, wow, I really like this. It, it wasn't so hard. I, I was really happy with the end result product. I used it you know, let me start investing in a chipper shredder because I, you know, I have 10 trees on my property and I just can't keep up with the leaves. Um, so you consider, consider investing in a chipper shredder and then always uh, be sure to mix the items well. <clears throat> 
And so I love this image that a colleague of mine shared um, when it comes to uh, volume size. So this is, uh, think about, you know, when, when you're thinking about the effect of ingredient size on volume, these are actually both 20 grams of leaves, but at different vol volumes. So, you know, much uh, larger, taking up a larger amount of space. Also uh, on the left, also particle size. So as you shred these down smaller and smaller, that creates more surface space for bacteria, fungi to come and act upon these. And so that what generates a lot of heat is these, these organisms are breaking this down. They're the ones generating heat and bringing um, energy to the pile. Um, so if they have more surface areas to feed on, that will um, impact the carbon nitrogen ratio and, and speed up the process. So I talked about this whole cold and hot idea. Um, so in a cold or passive compost system, it's really basically a pile or receptacle that's going to accumulate my material. Um, I'm adding my material continuously throughout the season. Um, I, I actually have a tumbler. So again, I add my green, my green kitchen waste material. I top it with, I have a bale of straw, straw sitting on the side and I turn that every time I go out. And it might be, you know, every week um, in the winter, things slow down. So I may be out there every couple of weeks. And it's just kind of as I remember, because this is my passive system, or I have normal room in my freezer to, to store my uh, vegetable or fruit trimmings. This is a slower process, and it's going to take months to a year to get a, a, a finished product. Now, if you have a hot or active compost system, this requires material in a required ratio. So you're building that batch of compost, um, layering it like the lasagna, watering it. Um, you're, so you're starting with all the materials at hand and not adding to this um, additionally later. So what you're doing is the, the, the effort becomes turning this. Um, so you wanna get out there with your thermometer, check the core temperature, and what you do is kind of flip the pile inside out. So any food products that are on the outer layers now could come to the core and they could start breaking that down again. Um, now there are different levels of organisms. You know, there's the mesophilic uh, bacteria where that's, you know, uh, more active in your pile when it's, you know, around 70 degrees. And then the thermo thermophilic um, bacteria will come in when it's above 100 degrees. So the breakdown process is still happening with, it's just different types of bacteria, some that are um, producing well in hotter temperatures, some at lower temperatures. When it comes to actinomyces, uh, these are like a higher form, similar uh, bacteria, and they are um, kind of more in that medium range. Um, so they're they're acting upon, you know, kind of <clears throat> the mid-range 70, 80 degree um, is when they're producing well, and they're really responsible of giving your compost that nice earthy smell. In a hot compost system, you could have um, a finished compost in, in a few weeks. <clears throat> so just kind of the pros and cons of hot versus cold. You may want to do hot compost if you want that finished compost in three to 12 weeks um, and you have the, the power to get out there on a weekly basis. Um, certainly it's gonna um, give you good exercise. Um, and then why to um, cold compost? Maybe you don't mind waiting a year or two for a finished compost. Um, you kind of wanna set it and forget it and, and add as you accumulate um, items from your yard or your kitchen. Um, so that's really your preference. And, and we went through the details of, of doing both. I mentioned that sheet composting or lasagna gardening. Um, this was a great demonstration when I was out in uh, Cleveland. Uh, one of their youth farms um, showed how, how they do their sheet composting. So again, layering those materials uniformly, kind of like the lasagna, starting out with kind of that uh, weed barrier, a little carbon rich material. So it could be cardboard followed by straw. Then they use a mix of top, topsoil, finished compost, 
added food waste and topped it with topsoil. So um, then you would let this sit. It may age, depending on the time of year, it may age a, a couple months, two to four months, and then you're ready to dig in. Again, this won't fly in every uh, municipality, so I would check on um, local ordinances when it comes to this. But I thought this was a great demonstration and, and could really work well for our urban farms, um, community uh, gardens, things like that. So we talked about composting being an aerobic process and uh, thinking about the temperature. So if you really get dig down into the temperature range, it could be from 55 degrees Fahrenheit to 160. Again, thinking about that 160 degree benchmark, um, as you hit that, you're going to be um, killing off your beneficial microbes but keeping in mind that you need about that 150 degree Fahrenheit range to kill off uh, weed seeds. Typically you're looking at a compost pile ranging at 122 to 131 um, degrees Fahrenheit, which is not gonna kill off all those pathogens. Um, and again, um, that compost that thermometer is certainly needed for hot composting, but optional for cold composting. Sometimes it's just interesting to see. Um, I always like to just check, okay, how, how hot is this in the center? Sometimes you could, you know, just get a feel for it with, with sticking your hand in there or if there's steam coming off, um, but, but a thermometer is gonna really pinpoint the, the temperature. So when you think about your container designs, um, a container, it may be mandatory, especially if you're doing food waste. Um, in Chicago, our ordinance is that a hole could not be larger than a quarter inch. Um, they worry about rodents chewing through there. Um, if you do have a problem with rodents like rats, which they, they have chew, chewed through a few of the plastic bins we used in Chicago, we reinforce that with a hardware, hardware cloth. So it's like, um, it's a nice hard metal sheet. Um, with, with small holes in it, it comes in different sizes. And again, I would stick to that quarter inch and you could reinforce holes or the bottom of your bin with, uh, with that if you're having a problem with rodents. Absolutely needs those ventilation holes. And think about the cont container design and allowing for access to, to building the pile, to harvesting, to turning it. So I see some of these commercial bins with like a door that opens on the bottom and you could access the bottom of the pile. And that's usually where you're gonna find uh, the finished product. Um, so that's something to consider. The tumblers have an accessible door, but it can be difficult to dump those out. So um, usually it's nice to have those raised up higher where you could dump it into something like a wheelbarrow and make it easy on yourself. <laughs> and then container um, will increase space efficiency and certainly uh, visual att attractiveness. So a few um, examples, a um, few right from our uh, master gardeners have uh, constructed these. So that's a image to the left of that hardware cloth um, getting reinforced in there. Um, you know, looking at this, this is probably allowing a lot of airflow in there. Um, so in dry conditions, you know, that could be problematic. You're probably going to have to supplement water in that. Whereas the uh, three bin system on the lower bottom, a little bit more protective, not allowing as much airflow, probably not needing as much supplemental watering. And then at the top, that's a one bin system. Um, again, reinforced with that hardware cloth. Um, and you can see as he's digging, pulling out some of that product, that's not even close to being um, decomposed. So as you're harvesting, digging through there, I'll talk about sifting compost because it's great to sift it to get a final product ready to use and leave any of the partially decomposed materials, put them back in the bin um, for more decomposition time. I talked about um, some of the commercial bins available. This was one we worked uh, with with the city. It was a subsidized, um, I call these the Darth Vader bins. And I'm blanking on the actual name, but this is the one with um, a harvestable door. I think it was called the Earth Machine. The harvestable door at the bottom was very useful to 
to get there and dig that in. But this actually came in two pieces. Um, sometimes they would get warped and it was hard to get them together, but I love being able to take off that top and getting to the base of the bin where I could actually maneuver, dig, um, harvest, turn. And then here's a tumbler here in the center where you could, um, you know, I'd like that how that's raised and I could get a wheelbarrow under there to dump it um, and uh, maneuver to really, this is my process now for sifting and getting a nice clean product after a year or so in this tumbler. And then these ones where, you know, maybe you don't have the arm strength to, um, to crank that handle on the tumbler. Well, you could have fun with the family and, and push this ball around the yard and, and, and that aerates the, the um, bin as well. I talked a bit about uh, composting indoors, right? There is um, an anaerobic process that you could use with uh, Bokashi. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but this actually allows you to um, use some of those materials you wouldn't in an aerobic system. It's a, you, you people have done composting with meat, bones, dairies. Um, so I did want to mention that um, won't go, I, I would say for your typical um, backyard composter or someone new to composting, um, I would probably hold off on starting with that. And if you could only do indoors, starting with something a little bit simpler, um, like a worm bin. Um, so if you're building a worm bin, this is a, an opaque storage container. You would use something like a 10 gallon size tote. You want to have a lid on there and you want to poke holes in the top. Just again, for ventilation, I usually just poke them on the top. You could put a few on the side, um, usually about one eighth um, hole in, uh, in size. And I just drill that with a drill bit. And then you're starting with uh, moistened newspaper. And what you would use are like red wigglers. So it's a special type of worm you would use in this system. You wouldn't dig them up from your backyard and use night crawlers. Night crawlers like to, to burrow. Um, they like it a lot cooler, around 50 degrees. So your red wigglers, they could um, tolerate the room temperature and their surface feeder. So they're happy in this system. And um, I do outdoor compost, but I also do indoor compost with this. And, and this is a quick turnaround time. In a worm compost bin, you could have a finished compost in three months. And it's basically the moistened uh, newspaper and then my kitchen scraps. Uh, the main downsides to this is that you could only, they only consume about their weight per day. Um, so you could only feed them, you, you typically start with a pound of red wigglers in here and they could eat about a pound per day, but they do eat the newspaper too. So I usually am giving about a half a pound every other day. The worst thing you could do with an indoor um, compost bin with worms is to overfeed it. So, so you want to be careful with that. At the time when I did not have an outdoor bin, because I'm in an apartment, um, I had to use four of these bins for my family of four to maintain just my, my food waste from my kitchen. There's also these electric uh, kitchen counter toppers uh, that compost and quite expensive, um, um, but, but know that they're out there. So batch composting, this is a good recipe for um, Hot composting, again, you're collecting all those materials, lay, layering up, building it up, letting it sit. Um, and then again, just turning it as needed, usually every week to two weeks um, and adding moisture as needed. And that could be, you know, she just retrofitted a, a garbage can here. So you could actually, uh, you know, easily do that. You could also um, purchase these ready-made. Feed as you go. So basically setting a base and adding materials if, as you get them. And that might be typically weekly or every other week. And of course, water in turn. So you build a base and then again, don't dump and run as you accumulate green materials um, from your kitchen or yard, uh, put those in, bury them, put more brown materials on top. I do like these three bin systems. For one, a lot of them have these removable slats in the front. Um, so we do have some designs on, on how to construct these yourself. And you could, um, the, the publication we have is kind of outdated that we worked on with the city, but I do have an old version. So if you wanted some specs on how to build this, um, you could email me. Um, of course, don't look at the prices because lumber is way up and 
in the cost of, of building this yourself is probably <clears throat> at least doubled, I would say. So these removable slats are great to getting to the base. And you could have different stages of composting. Like you could have your a brand new bin you built on, on the left to the middle bin where this, this material is almost done, ready to harvest. And then one midway through in the last bin. So I love having that. Um, if you have a large yard, you might need it. Um, if you have a community garden, this is great. Um, typically, I like to have like a corrugated top on here. Again, to just regulate moisture and wind coming into these systems. But if you layer it with a nice brown layer on top, hopefully that will um, help eliminate uh, drying out and will absorb some, some moisture from precipitation. So when you're looking at a readiness checklist for, <laughs> excuse me, composting, I like to go by the color. So it should be nice nice dark brown color, that earthy odor. You know, we don't want to smell any ammonia smells or, or any rotten food. You know, if, if, if that's the case, it needs to be decomposed further. Of course, not being an, I, to identify any of the original materials. You know, I sometimes grow <coughs> my um, avocado skin and seeds in there and, and those take a while to decompose. So you know, you might want to limit those or chop them up a little bit better. Um, and then I just put them back in the pile mm -hmm. if I'm sifting and they're, and they're not completely decomposed. <clears throat> Again, you could start this process is your, your pile might not be fully decomposed. You're just digging out the finished stuff. And, you know, that might be six months down the road from when you started this, if this was cold compost. And then again, I'm sifting that out, which I'll do a demonstration um, have some images and just getting the fully decomposed materials fall, falling through the sifter and the partially decomposed materials sitting on top. Um, with hot composting, you know, eventually when it's coming to an end, you know, it, it starts to not heat up as much. Um, there's, there's not enough material in there for bacteria, fungi to be acting upon and, and they're not heating as much. So that's kind of a, a, a signal that it's um, almost ready to harvest. And again, the readiness will vary depending on your management um, processes and along with materials and time of year. You know, I certainly wouldn't be out there in the winter harvesting. For one, it's cold and you don't have a lot of plants actively growing that you could use this on. So I talked a lot about sifting. Um, if you're taking one thing home today, a lot of people don't know to sift their compost. Um, so I, I make these compost sifters, again, using a wood frame and the hardware cloth, you could do different um, sizes. So I actually have a quarter inch screening for my seed starting compost I like to use, but I do more like a half inch screening um, for my garden compost. And so I put the, the sifter over <clears throat> a bucket or a uh, wheelbarrow and I put my um, compost from my bin in there and I run my hand over it, and then all these um, partially decomposed materials see in the center, I will put return back to the bin for further decomposition. And at the end, the far right, I'm seeing, wow, I have nice finished material of compost. It's dark in color, no odor. Um, <clears throat> what I like to, you know, if you're really curious is like, um, is this, you know, is this stable? Is this ready to use? Some people will put this in a jar, um, close it off and see if anything grows, any mold, any odor, you know, open it up after a week um, and check it out. You shouldn't see any of that if it's stable. You could also do a, a seed germination test um, and just try to sprout seeds and compost. If they sprout well, um, it's a signal that it's finished. So when you're using compost, you could, um, again, sip this first. It's great for them amending the soil and your flower vegetable beds. You could spread compost and work it into the soil. You could certainly spread it. Um, it's not, It's a little bit easier to spread when it's sifted over lawn. Um, so it's a great practice for you know for those of you that have lawns to um, do that nat, you know natural lawn care. Um, it's it's a little bit difficult to apply. So if you're more experienced, you could opt to make a compost tea. And that's a little bit easier to apply to something like turf grass. <clears throat> um, but top dressing lawns or where you're reseeding, 
bare patches of lawn, it's a great to put that down there before you seed. Of course, it could be used in landscape beds. The cleaner stuff I do use in my containers and house plants, seed starting mix. Um, I would, if you're going to do compost tea, there's recipes. I would look to other extension sites or Illinois Extension for compost tea recipes. You're kind of, uh, it's not just like the leachate that would run off uh, a compost bin. Let's say you have some water trickling down from a compost bin or some buildup in a worm bin and you collect it in a bucket and use it. That's not the same thing as, as compost tea, that's leachate. Uh, compost tea is made from finished compost and it's um, you could do it in a <clears throat> aerating system, but usually you're putting it in like a cheesecloth and, and steeping it like a tea bag um, to get uh, a nice finished product um, that's e a little bit easier to apply. And again, I mentioned those contributions of fertilizer are usually small depending on your materials, you know, usually less than 1% unless you had a high um, material range of your food waste manure that will increase nitrogen. <clears throat> okay, so what not to compost? Um, again, there are those anaerobic systems that could compost some of these, but in your typical aerobic compost bin in your backyard, or certainly in a worm bin, um, no meat, bones, or fish, no dairy products, greasy products. I always tell the kids that I'm working in schools with the worm bin, don't just scrape the, your leftover salad into there if it had dressing. Um, we need no, no oils, no, um, <clears throat> no grease, grease, things like that. Um, grains, breads, or beans. Um, this could attract rodents again. You know, there are commercial uh, worm, worm, composters that will use breads, but again, in your typical backyard garden, we don't recommend it, or in your typical worm bin. <clears throat> if, don't use that treated wood if you do opt to use sawdust. Um, disease plants, you don't want to put those in those cold piles. Uh, certainly no uh, pet feces. And then um, we have kind of find out in our latest research that pineapple and papaya have ne negative effects on worms. So that is not something I would put in my worm bin. When it comes to troubleshooting, um, you know, of course, remember that ideal size. So if the pile's too small, you, you might have to increase it. Remember you want that minimum three by three by three feet. <clears throat> so one cubic yard. Um, if a new pile, add those nitrogen rich starters like grass clippings. You know, I try, there are, um, kind of uh, inoculants or compost starters that you could purchase. But I just try to, to use that, um, a, a scoop full of topsoil, grass clippings, and that's gonna give me enough uh, compost starter that I need. Manure blood meal could work. Um, so something, yeah, rich in nitrogen like blood meal would be a good one if you wanna build up that heat um, versus investing in more of the expensive uh, compost starters. Um, make sure you're turning it to aerate it. If uh, the pile is built up over time, um, that's not an issue. It's again, you think of it as cold compost and you dig down, it might not look like it from the outside of the pile, but you dig down to the base core, you'll be finding some finished product. Um, that ideal level of uh, water capacity, 50 to 60%, like that wrung out sponge, <clears throat> add water to your pile as you add materials. And again, if it's too wet, you could add those drier carbon rich materials. <clears throat> At the moment, our uh, website is undergoing some changes. So I didn't have a great direct link to our compost resources, but we did develop a, a compost initiative page in Cook County. So you could go there and check out um, what we're doing in the Cook County area, but also have some useful handouts. I did include one handout that's um, in Spanish and English, I'm happy to say, and that is in the box folder that I shared, and also a one-page handout on worm composting, and those are to accompany the slides I shared with you all in that box folder. Um, don't forget, we, you could always view past recordings if you're interested in other subject areas. You could go to our Four Seasons Gardening Series page on YouTube. Um, I'll be working on closed captioning this session, this recording, 
and hope to get it up in a couple weeks. So stay tuned. And then if you have any questions, we're gonna, um, I'll, I'll go to the next slide, but leave this up for a minute. Um, Jamini will go ahead and put the direct link to our evaluation from today. Love to hear feedback from you all. Um, love to hear ideas on new topics. Um, and we will follow up with this uh, either later today or by tomorrow. So just do this survey, this evaluation once. It's short and sweet. You could scan this QR code with your mobile device if you're not um, watching on your mobile device, or you could go to that direct link in the chat box that Jamie will um, put. And again, I'll follow up if you don't have time now, I'll follow up with the evaluation in an email. And then let me uh, leave this up for my contact info.